the atomic age started with the dropping of a bomb. Let's all hope and pray that it won't end with the same event. The uh, reaction of the President of the United States, Harry Truman, when, was that we've got to make a blessing out of this awful thing. And that began America's uh, greatest public guilt trip, uh, which has continued on through the decades. I think if you were not alive at that time, as I was, you would not fully appreciate the enormity of the genuineness of the guilt trip. I mean, uh, rather than debating whether we should or shouldn't have dropped the bomb, uh, no one uh, wanted to talk about that at the time, uh, but we were deluged uh, with the most uh, vivid descriptions of how this awesome power, uh, this almost godlike power, would be turned uh, to the use of the benefit of mankind. And we found out that the tsunami and earthquake happened. Immediately we knew that we were going to uh, reroute the ship to Japan to provide aid and um, you know, give them food, water. Um, so we did that immediately. We probably got to the coast of Japan the, probably the day after it happened. Um, we never heard anything about a nuclear power plant. We never knew anything about the possibility, let alone any kind of leak. Um, so we were there outside. Our job as quartermasters um, is not only navigating the ship, driving, plotting our course and track, but going outside at the top of the ship to raise flags um, to communicate with other ships. Um, so being outside, we were breathing in this radiation. We were handling flags, which are porous, very porous material, obviously. Um, we didn't really hear anything for probably a couple weeks after about um, a leak in the uh, power plants. Um, and even then, it was just still considered kind of a rumor. We, the ship didn't really even go on lockdown, which I mean by that, like no one was allowed outside. Um, probably until about a month and a half after um, the initial, the, the 11th, March 11th. So um, about halfway through, probably around the summertime, my menstrual cycle just disappeared completely. And then it would come back and disappear and go on and off. And this happened until about the summer of 2012, where it came back in such full force that um, I was in and out of the emergency room um, once they thought they were going to have to do a blood transfusion on me because I had lost so much. Um, this is called dysfunctional uterine bleeding and um, we can give you an IUD with hormones in it. And so now that's what I have. Um, it hasn't really stopped it. I still have this issue. In addition to that, in February 2012, I developed bronchitis. Um, and then from February to the summer of 2012, I got it six times. I was sent to a respiratory doctor and it was determined that I developed asthma. So a lot of people um, don't understand that once you get out of the Navy, you don't get any health care at all. Um, if you retire and you stay in 20 years, you get health care. But we only did one enlistment. I did five years, he did four. So we don't, we don't get that unless it's a disability, a service-related disability, which dysfunctional uterine bleeding does not really count as a disability as of yet. So we're still fighting that case. And this is also what we're involved in a lawsuit against TEPCO um, for, for medical expenses that we're now having to, we're going to have to pay out of pocket for. The Fukushima Daiichi accident was made in America. The um, reactor was designed by General Electric and uh, built by a company called Ebasco. Uh, I, I used to go to the Ebasco offices right here in Manhattan when I was an engineer. On, uh, on Millstone Unit 1, which was almost identical to uh, Fukushima Daiichi Unit 1. Uh, it was licensed by the uh, Atomic Energy Commission, which at the time, in 1960s, uh, was the uh, ultimate authority on nuclear licensing in the world. At least, at least we thought that to be the case. Now, the NRC assumes that containments leak at 1% a day. So in a, in a building this, in a room this size, what we're saying is that the, the gases that are released um, 
would, um, would be about 1%, meaning over 100 days, the gases in this room would leave and fresh gases would come in behind it. But what the NRC said in a phone call um, on, um, uh, on March 23rd is that the reactors at Daiichi were leaking at 300% per day. That means that the gases inside Daiichi were leaving the containment every eight hours. Whatever radiation was getting out of that nuclear fuel was being liberated to the environment within eight hours because the containment leak rate was 300% per day, not 1% like the NRC assumes. Less than two grams of cesium-137, a piece smaller than an American dime, if made into microparticles and evenly distributed over as a radioactive gas over an area of one square mile, will turn that square mile into an uninhabitable radioactive exclusion zone. Central Park in New York City can be made uninhabitable by two grams of microparticles of cesium-137. Hard to believe, isn't it? Remember, these nuclear poisons are lethal at the atomic level. I included an extra slide just to note the immense inventories of cesium-137, 150 million curies that are located in the nearby spent fuel pool at Indian Point Nuclear Power Plant, which is about 40 miles from here by road and less than that as the radioactive cloud flies. Many of the 104 US nucle uh, commercial nuclear reactors and power plants have more than 100 million curies of cesium-137 in their spent fuel pools. This is many times more than the spent pools at Fukushima. So now that we have some idea of the extreme toxicity of cesium-137, let's look at the extent of the contamination of the Japanese mainland. If Japanese children are allowed to routinely ingest foodstuffs contaminated with cesium-137, they will likely develop the same health problems that we see now in the children and teenagers of Belarus and Ukraine. Thus, it's very important that we recognize the danger posed to children by the routine ingestion of contaminated food with cesium-137, wherever they might live. Look across the bottom. That's the lifespan, zero to 80. We hope longer, but this graph ends at 80. And look at the vertical. That's increased cancer risk by exposure to a given amount of radiation. And I want to just say that I think that this is a little bit of a fictional story here, but it's a very important pink line and blue line. What is the blue line? The blue line is boys turning to men, turning to old men. What is the pink line? The pink line is little girls turning to women, turning to old women. And if you look at that left-hand part, that is zero to five years lumped together graphically by Ian, but it's actually a, a five-year group. And it includes pre-birth. Pre and what do we see? We see a striking difference between the blue line and the pink line. He added the little green circle that's on the 30-year-old male blue line because that is what our regulators assume to be the individual who's getting any dose of radiation that we're talking about yesterday and today. All of the radiation we've been talking about assumes that is the individual getting that dose. Whereas this graph really unfolds the entire life cycle of our species if you want to take these numbers. And these numbers are suspect, but how suspect are they? Are we going to flush a 100% difference between 0 and 5, between the blue line and the pink line? Are we going to ignore it completely? And even at the point of the uh, green circle, this graph is a little bit off, I think, because there's a 50%, 40 to 60% difference between adult males and adult females. These are environmentally induced microcephalies. It's not that the gene came in and said, don't make the brain. No, the genes were fine, but the radiation said, die and reduce your size. Multiple things that disrupt the development and multiple things that disrupt the repair of the damage, because we have regenerative capabilities. So you have this balance, and if it is unbalanced, then the morphogenesis of the embryo becomes altered. So I did not talk about conjoined twins, but that's what we see. I did not talk about teratomas, that is what we see. 
I did talk a little bit about neural tube defects, but there are many subcategories and associations. I did talk with microcephaly, and I did not touch much about microphthalmia, but there are all kinds of things that the world needs to know because these birth defects occur in China and Indonesia, India, and anywhere else. And the more we know, the better we're, we're going to prevent them. So what I want to tell you is that as a physician, prevention is first, not epidemiology. But what we do see are very strangely anomalous uh, organisms, including you know, birds with very strange color patterns. So here's a barn swallow here, he's a partial albino. Here's a better view of the sorts of strange uh, color patterns. Again, not enough to kill any bird, but this bird, this is a male bird, and you can bet that this will influence his reproductive success. Girls don't like this. Girl birds don't like this color pattern. Um, Interestingly enough, I just got this photo by email from the, from the Japan Wild Bird Association just the other day. Uh, and this is from uh, Minamisoma, which is a little town just north of the reactor on the coast. And I don't know if you can see this. See these little patches of white feathers here? This is, what we, this is where we started first seeing anomalies in Chernobyl. And uh, I, so I was shocked and surprised, well maybe I shouldn't have been, but I was uh, surprised that they would capture these photos and send them to me. Uh, so, so we're starting to see some, some consequences potentially. We need to go back and verify that this is real. But we see all sorts of strange abnormalities, tumors on the beaks, uh, strange growths on the beaks, strange missing patches of skin. And let me just skip ahead a little bit. Tumors around the eye are really quite common. Um, here's a tumor over on the side of the head, uh, patches of white feathers where there shouldn't be white feathers, Some strange growths on their feet, tumors on their wings, here's a close-up, uh, strange growths around their, their rear ends, just never been seen anywhere else in any great abundance and they're much more common in areas of high contamination. Their brains are smaller. The uh, neurological development's clearly impacted as a consequence of the, the contamination in direct proportion. And not only that, if they have smaller brains, they, have, they clearly have reduced cognitive function because they're much less likely to survive to the next year with these smaller brains. So why has it been so easy Apparently easy. It's not been easy in the sense I've had to eat a lot of Russian food. Uh, but uh, why has it been so easy for us to go in and document one response after the next that just they just they slap you in the face? They're so easy to find. It really hasn't taken uh, you know a genius to make these observations. Uh, they're they're there, and the answer is of course that nobody has looked. Or, or if they've looked, they haven't follow, followed through to compile the data and to analyze it properly and then to finally you know, publish it. Why is that? Why haven't they done this? Vladimir, why haven't they done this? Yes, sir. That's exact. I, uh, that's that's what I'm thinking. They don't want to know the answer to these questions. And, and, and so how are they avoiding finding the answers? They they just don't pay for research in this area. Um, so. It is up to us in the more objective uh, areas of, of, of the research community to stand up to this. We need to, first of all, conduct studies immediately, as soon as we can. We need to use Whatever data we have, even though it's going to take decades and decades to really find out what the full uh, meaning of, of, of Fukushima was, we have, to, we have to start now. And most importantly, we have to get this information out into the public so that they understand we're not dealing with a small leak here, we're dealing with a, an extremely serious situation. Uh, we picked the topic newborn hypothyroidism, and for those that don't of you who don't know, hypothyroidism is a condition where the um, level of thyroid hormone is very low and the gland is underactive. When this occurs in uh, newborns, 
it um, can do great harm to any physical and mental development. We know hypothyroidism is something that's sensitive to radiation, to, to iodine. We've seen it before and we've documented it in our paper. Uh, experiments on rats years ago. Um, people in the South Pacific exposed to atomic bomb fallout. Um, people uh, living downwind from Three Mile Island and people uh, from and after the Chernobyl accident, all showed in increased uh, levels, uh, rates of hypothyroidism. And we also know that the fetus and the newborn are far, far more sensitive than adults to a particular dose of radiation. So I had to call up all 50 states, uh, newborn screening programs. I yearn for the day when this country has three states instead of 50. Um, 41 states responded. Um, we, we found that the five states on the west coast and the Pacific, California, Oregon, Washington, Alaska, and Hawaii, tended to have the highest levels of not just gross beta that we found, but other uh, researchers have found high levels in kelp and in soil and, and, and air as well. So we compared the changes, the 20 to 10, 2011 changes uh, in the cases of newborn hypothyroidism for these five states versus the rest of the country, the other 36 states for which we had data. Um, we found the following. We found that in the first 15 weeks after the fallout from Japan arrived in the United States, the number of newborn thyroid hypothyroid cases increased 28% on the West Coast, and for the rest of the year, the last nine months, increased 16.5%. Uh, this is compared to the rest of the country in which we saw a 3% decline. Uh, the differences are statistically significant, although we do point out in the article that these aren't a huge number of cases. I am proud to be here and express my vision, my understanding of the Chernobyl situation. 24 years ago, it was Mikhail Gorbachev who asked me to chair the, commi the Committee of Ecology of Soviet Parliament. I was Soviet parliamentarian. It was, I immediately uh, understand, locate, that Chernobyl is the number one environmental catastrophe in the Soviet Union. And later, Gorbachev accept that from Chernobyl, Chernobyl, it was start to collapse of Soviet Union. I was in 2011年、福島原発事故当時、日本の総理を務めていました菅直人でございます。最悪のシナリオというものを私自身、さらには専門家にも検討してもらいました。先ほど申し上げたように福島第一第二原発を合わせると十の原発と十一の使用済み燃料プールがありますこれらが全てコントロール不能になってそれらがメルトダウンしそして放射性物質を大気中や海水中に放出した時にどれだけの量の放射性物質が外に出ていくのかチェルノブイリの事故がこれまでの事故では最も大きかったわけですがチェルノブイリ事故は一気の原発事故でありましたそれに比べて実機の原発がさらには使用済み燃料プールがコントロール不能になった
首都圏も含まれておりましてその中に住んでいる我が国の国民は約 5,000 万人人口の半分近くに達しますもしこの地域から 5,000 万人の人々が家を捨てあるいは職場を離れ学校を離れあるいは入院している人たちは病院を離れて避難しなければならないそういう状態になっていればその避難の過程でも多くの犠牲者が出たでありましょうしその後の日本は国としての機能を長期間にわたって十分果たせないまさにそういう極めて重大な最悪のシナリオが紙一重の状態にあったわけであります。It is important to note that as physicians and scientists and PSR and those who work with us, uh, that we have no special vested interest uh, for or against nuclear power. But we take our oaths to protect the public's health seriously, and we speak primarily with the medical voice. I think it's important to also understand that nuclear scientists and those who spend their entire lives working with radiation or whose livelihoods are dependent or associated with this technology are naturally going to have a different perspective and a different risk assessment from us. We should recognize this difference, but strive to find an objective approximation of the truth. What is clear, however, is that as a species, we have tended to choose expediency and short-term benefit over the longer-term responsibility to our ecosystem and to future generations. It used to be that it appeared that we had the luxury of doing what we wanted to satisfy our own needs for growth or development or simply to satisfy our desires. We could take what we wanted and throw away anything we wanted to. And we just assumed that we, that we would always have enough fuel or commodities or the great big ocean or the wide atmosphere would just swallow up our waste and our hubris. Now, in this Anthropocene age, we know that this is no longer true, and it never was true. We have failed to see the implications of our actions, and they have threatened not only our existence, but the very existence of life on this planet. So it is in this light that we must look at our choices for energy production. We must weigh carefully the risks and benefits, and we must seek to include all of the externalities for nuclear power, this includes the medical and public health consequences of the entire fuel cycle, from the mining and enriching of the nuclear fuel, its transport, operations in the nuclear reactors, their inevitable accidents and releases, and then the reprocessing, waste disposal, and the proliferation of fissile materials and production of nuclear weapons. It is no longer acceptable to continue with the status quo. We must shake loose the shackles of the old ways that have bound us to a course that will lead to our inevitable destruction and do as Einstein demanded, adopt a new way of thinking if we are to survive. That I was so annoyed and frustrated with the arrogance and ignorance of the media about radiation biology after Fukushima, especially with one George Monbiot at The Guardian, who knew nothing about internal emitters or anything, and they, and they kept saying people haven't dropped dead, and they're still saying that. That I thought it was appropriate to sort of set up a medical conference for two days, like medical school, to teach them the basic elements of radiation biology. And that's why I put this symposium together to educate the media. Unfortunately, there were representatives here, but we could have had a lot more, so they're not really quite turned on to it yet. And I suppose I have to say that uh, the American media really worries about Americans, like a little girl trapped down a well or that sort of thing. Um, and it was interesting to note that when the sailors came along, that very was very pertinent because they're Americans. And I don't think people can extrapolate too much in this country to Japanese. Number one. And number two, when Chernobyl happened, I can remember being on a telephone in the Texas airport talking to an ABC radio commentator um, who said, well, they're just Russians. 
And I was absolutely flabbergasted. I said, I'm a physician and every human life is precious. So that attitude of insularity uh, prevails and it's prevailed today. So the only way to turn this country upside down, as Jefferson said, an informed democracy will behave in a responsible fashion. Now you see these kids on their cell phones, tweeting and twittering and walking along, emailing each other and stuff. They're not reading papers, they're not, not watching the news, they do not understand the nuclear age which they are inheriting. They are inheriting massive quantities of radioactive waste which will leak in the future, get into the food supply and over time induce epidemics of cancer, leukaemia and genetic disease, congenital malformations forevermore. You can imagine our descendants waking up in the morning. The food already radioactive, the breast milk radioactive, the babies being born deformed because they're exposed to radiation in utero, which we heard from Dr. Wurtzelecki, um, and getting cancer at the age of six because they're ex exposed very early or in utero. That's the heritage we leave to our descendants. And we can talk till the cows come home about nuclear accidents, which is severe. But the most important issue is this radioactive waste piling up all over the world and no one knows where to put it and we don't know where to put it and we never will. And I've been debating with the nuclear industry for 42 years and they say don't worry, we're good scientists, we'll find the answer to radioactive waste. They haven't attended to it. I mean they're like surgeons, you know. We don't clean up after us, we just let the nurses clean up. We're not interested in the waste we create. We're arrogant. Well, so are they. They're interested in building bombs and designing nuclear parts. It's all very exciting. So I, I, I say to them, well, that's like me saying to a patient, I'm sorry, but you have pancreatic cancer. That's what the CT scan shows. And your prognosis is probably six months, but don't worry, I'm a very good doctor. In 20 years time, I'll find the cure but there will never be a cure to the storage of radioactive waste. So we're in a very, very, very serious predicament. And as Tim Rousseau's work shows that we're not the only ones with genes and who get congenital malformations. All plants and animals have genes. And what we're doing with this radioactive waste or when it leaks out from reactors or whatever, the earth is in the intensive care unit, gravely ill. And we are all physicians now to the dying planet. And unless we move and dedicate our total life to saving it, we leave our children nothing. And I think it's terribly important to get down to where we really live, where we, who do we really love? What would we do to save our child? Will we dedicate our lives like a lioness or a lion protecting the cubs? Forget about all the data and the figures and stuff. Listen to your intuition and you'll know what you've got to do. So I just want to give you a picture of how dire the situation is. How we stay up all night with a dying patient. And we don't even think about tiredness until we hit the wall at 2am and have to have a hamburger and a milkshake. But you don't think about yourself when you're treating patients. So we mustn't think about ourselves or our lives when we're trying to save the planet. The only life in the universe, probably. The responsibility is so huge. And I wouldn't talk like this unless I knew there were answers. Abolish the nuclear weapons, now. Close down all those reactors, now. And stop burning fossil fuel, now. And fill the country up with, with solar and wind and geothermal and conservation and it would make the Americans so proud. They need to be proud of something now. And that, that revolution has to come from you. Huh? Because I'm 75, I'll probably be dead soon. Okay. So, uh, look, I want to thank all the...